Mm -hmm. All right, good. We are recording. Hello, everybody. So I'm Darcy. I am the creator of the Vibrant Woman course and community, which I'm delighted to say the registration on that opened today. Um, this is being pre-recorded. So on the day that you all are watching this, registration will still be open. Um, and we'll provide some links below. Part of the course that I teach is about helping women to um, learn to tune into their bodies, to the wisdom there. And this has everything to do with just sort of redefining what we consider to be health and fitness. If you've been watching me for any bit at all, you know that I talk a lot about food and nutrition, how absolutely crucial that is to thriving uh, in a human body, how important it has been on my own journey of healing. And so I am delighted today to share with you my friend, Brandy, who, um, I, yeah, I don't think I'm even going to introduce you. I think I'm going to let you do it. You're going to do it much better than I could. She's here to talk to us today about food, food justice, um, the system, everything. We've got a lot to learn. So without further ado, Brandy, I really want to just um, invite you to introduce yourself and tell us, um, yeah, what you're up to these days. Thank you so much for having me, Darcy. I really appreciate it. It's always exciting to, you know, get to talk about the things that, you know, we're passionate about, that we geek out on, that we give, you know, our lives to maybe outside of um, our families or our kiddos. But um, yeah, I, my name is Brandy Williams. I am the owner of Primally Inspired Eats. We are a gluten-free uh, bakery, um, a micro bakery, I call us a lot, uh, which doesn't encompass all of what we are. We keep adding things on and um, always exploring um, health through nutrition. That's sort of how we started our business and um, had a kiddo that had sensitivities. And so we launched into wanting to make sure that, um, yeah, that, that, that our kiddos never missed out on the really yummy, good foods and never felt like they were um, missing out on the conventional items that maybe some of their friends were reaching for. And so, yeah, we've always um, baked and cooked and uh, provided food from scratch. We grow a lot of our own foods. We have our pie gardens, urban farm. We have our own chickens that we collect eggs from and use that in all of our baking goods, um, grow our own herbs and vegetables and a lot of our fruits and incorporate that into our baking and cooking as well. Um, yeah, we sell online uh, for order and pickup and delivery, and then we sell at People's Market as well. So yeah, been a little bit of a bumpy ride through COVID, but uh, we're still here. Primary Inspired is still here and still, still providing really good nutrient-dense food for our customers and our local community. So yeah, let me that's just, what keeps us busy. <laughs> let me just say this as well, too, because I, we actually, we're going to have watchers from um, actually many other places around the world. So I just want to name Brandy and I both live in Bloomington, Indiana, which yeah. is uh, located actually on unceded land right by the Miami yes. and Kickapoo people. That's the anglicized version of their names, but just want to call out where we are in the world, absolutely. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's important. Um, land acknowledgement always is at the forefront of our minds um, when, um, yeah, we're residing on borrowed land, stolen land, you know, all of us are. So I appreciate that, Darcy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Bloomington, Indiana is our is the area we service. And um, yeah, it's been it's been great. We're primarily inspired is, like I said, chugging along after after a long uh, up and down pandemic uh, experience. <laughs> so not the easiest for anyone in the food industry uh, mm -hmm. the last couple of years, but we're grateful for our customers who have buoyed us and for people's market um who has buoyed us as well because it, they they certainly invest in their in their farmers and vendors and 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 give quite a minute quite a bit of support and have been quite a bit of support over the last few years so yeah grateful to still be here but um and that kind of subways into what else we do <laughs> primarily inspired is a huge part of that um what keeps us busy but i'm also one of the incorporators of people's cooperative market so it's a local farmer's market um, that focuses on food justice and racial justice and the intersectionality of all of that, um, which is encompasses a lot. Um, and 
Yeah, so that has been a huge springboard um, for us personally, or for me personally, to explore some of the intersectionality of my own identity and how that affects my business and, and how we service our customers. And um, I know Darcy, we were talking earlier, Darcy, that one of the one of the big things that I've been contemplating um, specifically as a brown woman, as a Mexican woman, is this um, you know, generational racial trauma that we carry within ourselves. And what does that mean health-wise? What does it mean for our bodies? Um, and what does it mean in relation to food justice and racial justice? And one of the big concepts that I've been exploring is um, how the body holds this trauma generationally and the body becoming sort of this coffin where we bury this racial trauma over generations and how does that present itself in black brown indigenous and marginalized communities and we do see that when you look at the statistics mortality rates disease rates across the board you know black brown indigenous and marginalized communities fare much poorer um, than the white community uh, and so, and that was very, that uh, COVID was a big eye opener there for all of us as well. Uh, Latina communities, black communities, indigenous communities were hit the hardest yeah. um, when it came to percentages of those that were sick and the percentage of those who died um, from COVID. And a lot of that had to do um, with already being, um, you know, pre-existing conditions already. And, and what I've been hy hy hypothesizing about is holding this trauma within our bodies and it manifesting as, you know, dis-ease, disease. Um, and so that would cause, you know, we have these pre-existing pre pre conditions um, that then make you more likely to die of something like COVID during right. the pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, we've, I've, I've been exploring this and how, how Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks experience Experience the system that we live in. It's very much experienced as a violent colonial settler system um, that is based on a on white supremacist ideology. And so you have Black, Brown, Indigenous, and marginalized folks walking through this world and this system with all these extra layers of um, systematic and institutional violence and inequity. And and we know, we know scientifically that we carry those traumas in our body. And so it kind of just pinpoints the real need or where the starting point is for me for, for food and racial justice just really starts to point to access, mm. access to land, mm. access to seeds, access to growing our own food and access to local nutrient dense food if we are not able to grow it ourselves. Uh, and so I really feel as though that that is where our discussion needs to begin when we're talking about food and racial justice. It really is a, a big part of that is about, you know, uh, supporting local farmers, having the ability to grow the food. But when we start looking at the, the newest, research, new, newest research on a lot of this, it shows us that we actually have plenty of of nutrient dense food in the system, mm -hmm. it's it's really about lack of access. Um, and so when when we ask that question, you know, how to how do we get better access, you know, to these things, um, we can point to an organization like People's Cooperative Market, right, with food and racial justice at its core of its mission, values, and goals. Uh, and a couple of those examples of how when you center that ideology, how, you know, a couple of examples, how that manifests in a local community um, on the farmer side, it manifests as investing in local black and brown farmers. Um, we do live in Indiana. A lot of Indian people think that black and brown farmers don't exist because mm -hmm. we do live in a predominantly white state, white community, but they do. I mean, there are historical places like Lyle Station, um, down south that was historically a large black farming community before the Civil War, um, was involved with the Underground Railroad. Uh, and there's a lot of historical references like that. We have local farmer, local black farmers, Three Flock Farm, Lauren Bolt is a sheep farmer, um, Outlier Farmstead that is a, is a farm 
that participates with People's Market is, is a BIPOC owned farm and run farm. Um, and then, and, and, and we also, there's other farms, Legacy is down south, a black owned farm. Um, so part of, part of access is also acknowledging that historically black, black and brown folks have farmed and how do we continue to, how do we invest in those who are, who are attempting to do that now? You know, how do we use our organizations, our resources um, to do that? And like with People's Market, we center those vendors. We prioritize those vendors. We make sure that um, we are highlighting those vendors. If we can invest in help getting seed, if we can invest in helping pick up high tunnels, if we can, you know, all these different things that we can do to help create better access for black, brown, indigenous and marginalized folks to have their own land, farm their own land and, and be able to sell their products um, and even possibly process their, you know, the, the excess for themselves mm -hmm. um, is one example of how it manifests. Another example on the consumer side is like people's, people's market has their sponsored box program. So every week the stores open Monday through Wednesday, you log on people's market, btown.org. You can go down and you can sponsor produce, meat, eggs and bread so you can do that individually or you can do you can purchase a whole meal um, box which includes all four of those so literally and then what happens is those who are experiencing in our community who are experiencing food scarcity which historically has been predominantly black and brown and indigenous folks can get on our website with complete dignity anonymity and request whatever food that they need for that week and then we match up the sponsored boxes with the requested boxes and we deliver those, um, that food to those individuals experiencing food scarcity each and every week on Saturdays. Um, and so we're, we're, by doing that, we're ensuring access to fresh local nutrient dense nutrient food. And we're making it affordable in the sense that you can request it for free. We all, People's Market also accepts SNAP and EBT, and we double that as well. So if you have that available, you're, you're able to purchase in that way. Um, so yeah, making a, making local nutrient-dense food accessible and affordable for our community is another way to help um, equal the playing field, you know, address those historically inequitable um, barriers to access to land, seed, growing, and, and the actual nutrient-dense food. It's a it's lot. lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. lot. And I'm, I'm just, I've, I've got goosebumps all over though. I'm, I'm, as I'm, yeah. as I'm just riding along with you, as you explain it so yeah. clearly, um, you explain it so clearly. And I want you to just, if you would take a minute for some of our viewers who may not really understand, and I, I admit it wasn't that long ago that I was one of them, like, you know, my mm -hmm. vibrant woman course and my, and my private coaching, I've, I've been, because this was transformative for me. When you talk about nutrient dense food, you're talking about food that like comes out of mineral rich soil and, yeah. and very soon after is consumed in a minimally processed or cooked way by the human body. We're not yeah. talking about stuff that comes in boxes and bags that's been sitting on, it made in a factory, right. loaded onto a truck, stored right. in a warehouse, put on another yeah. truck, put on a yeah. shelf in a store. I mean, I've been talking about this for a very long time about this nutrient dense food. And the piece that I was really missing um, because I hadn't had the experience yet of really understanding why um, farmland, why land ownership was so racially, um, disproportionate, like why it's so unjust. Can you just, can you help us to fill in some of those pieces? Like if you go to, cause, and this is what I taught in my course last year. And I got some feed, I got some feedback that really helped me look deeper. Mm -hmm. I was talking, Oh, you know, get it from a farmer's market. If you can, if you can't. And, and some right. people were, most of the women that I was talking to did have access to that. They did have the means to do that, but they were saying, right. even they were saying like, well, hold on, isn't there, you know, an access issue? To which, you know, in my ignorance, I would say, well, there is, there is, right. of course there is, but, you know, us not taking advantage of what we have access to doesn't necessarily help others, but we absolutely have to go the step farther and say, yeah. okay, how do we make sure everybody has access and why didn't they, and what are the things we have to do about that? Can you just help us fill in that gap? Yeah. I mean, so it, 
it is um so there's a lot of layers to that there yeah. are i mean when you're talking <laughs> about access to um when you're talking about access to land and growing i mean that i mean historically you know land was annexed taken there were lack of access to farm loans based on racial inequity you know so at one time there were nearly 1500 acres of you know 1500 plus acres of black owned farmland you know in indiana in the south and uh, in southern indiana that was reduced down to just a minuscule amount based on access to resources um, based on the fact that black and brown farmers were not prioritized in that way and so there was a lot of land loss and i mean we're not even talking about land loss from the indigenous folks right like native americans and that sort of thing and the land acknowledgement that you did in the beginning here um, which is almost an entirely that's like you know pre all of all of that and, and an entire discussion in and of itself but when you're talking about the access and then on the other side when you're talking about on the consumer side actual access to that nutrient dense food that's coming out of the mineral rich soil and you're consuming it within you know hours or days of it coming out of the ground um, you can talk about affordability of that um, there's this uh, disjunction between what farmers need to get you know to sustain themselves for what they grow and who is actually able to afford to purchase that particular product um and that's where we that we have a system breakdown it's institutional mm -hmm. and systematic right like right. Who, who, who has the resources to get access to that um and so that's one of the reasons like programs like snap program building a co a co-op with sliding scale availability for people for people who can play zero and for people who can pay more are able to pay more and we're able to for that able to even out and balance out so that everyone then does have access to that same amount of food mm -hmm. you also have to talk about things like gentrification and who has um access transportation wise yeah. to even pick that food up Right. So even if I, that's one reason why we offer to deliver sponsored boxes as well, because it's one thing to say, okay, we have this food for you, come and get it. Well, if you don't have the means to come and get it, then yeah. you, there's still a barrier to getting your hands on that food. And so, so part of the whole goal of food justice and racial, racial justice and the intersectionality of that is literally just like section by section, taking, almost taking like bricks out of a wall like mm -hmm. breaking down these individual barriers, right? Which is a lot, it's a lot, you know? And so being involved with an organization like People's Market who continually, literally it is driven by this passion and need and for, for black and brown folks, this urgency to, to quickly break down those barriers so that we have access so that we stop so that we stop dying in these numbers right mm -hmm. because we know that nutrition and lifestyle play a huge impact on a scope of diseases and and um you know our bodies manifesting it with dis-ease in general absolutely uh, and so yeah that's why i feel i really feel like you just and we have a lot it's, it's a it can be a real flashpoint discussion honestly when you're talking about what food justice and racial justice really is and and depending on what what uh lens that you're looking through can really affect that in a dramatic way um and also because if you are for instance if you do not center black brown indigenous marginalized folks in this conversation you're not necessarily going to get to these just deep rooted discussions around generational trauma within the body and how that is related to local nutrient dense food and getting access. If you don't have those marginalized voices at the center of that discussion, you're never gonna quite get there, right? And so one of, one of the driving forces for me is we really need to be listening to black, brown, indigenous, marginalized folks within our local food system so that we can chip away at 
you know, the racial inequity within that system. We, we definitely have to support our farmers, but we can't, we can't just support farmers, have the upper, you know, echelon of economic um, wealth able to access that food that those farmers are producing and call that food justice, yeah. right? Like that, that, that's a portion, right? Like it's, it's in the pie mm-hmm. of food justice, it feels like it's a portion, it's a section, it's a percentage, but it's not the end all be all. And, you know, I would, I would, I would go as far as to say that, you know, Bloomington has a vibrant local food system. I would say that we could be doing a much better job about focusing in on this intersectionality of racial justice and food justice. Um, I think we've, we've, we've failed, um, you know, we've failed man- marginalized communities with, within Bloomington. Um, and we've, you know, we failed ourselves when, when we're not taking care of the least amongst us, you know, then um, it's really, we're not really making an impactful um, mark in our community. And so uh, th- these are difficult discussions to have because they're a springboard into, you know, a lot of discussions around racial inequity and what does, you know, what does that mean? And, um, you know, and when you're talking about it being systemic and sy- systematic and institutional, um, that gets tricky, you know, and, and can get really uncomfortable and, um, yeah, it takes a lot of dedication and passion and drive to keep coming back and having those conversations. But I think it emphasizes why, again, it's so important to have those marginalized voices at the center because it's not a choice for us. It's not a choice for me as a brown woman to not think about these things. It's not a choice for, you know, my lovely farmer friend, Lauren Bolt um, at Three Thought Farm to not think about the inequity of you know, being a black farmer. It's just, it's just not a choice. Um, You wake up every day thinking about it. You wonder about how it's affecting your own health. You wonder uh, about how it's affecting your family's health. Um, And it's, uh, it's a driving force, you know, and the more, the more you research, the more you dig, the more you realize, you know, disproportionately the, the statistics and the research and even locally recently, it's, um, the it was a um, IU Critical Food Studies Lab and Upland Food and Farm Council um, did a Bloomington Food Access report, and I'm going to look at the numbers because I just recently it just I just recently got my hands on it, but it's just a, a small example. So, and this is here in Bloomington, so this is really you can like chew on this a bit locally, but it says that one in ten Bloomington residents, one of the number one issues that they found in this report was one in ten Bloomington residents cannot access the foods that they need, okay? So again, we're talking about access. We're not talking about production and there being a lack of production or a lack of that nutrient-dense food. It's really about access. And over 45% of Bloomington residents say they need better access to at least one type of food. Wow. Um, And 45%, 45? 45% of Bloomington residents say they need better access Mm. to at least one type of food. That's profound. That's yeah. profound. And then, so let's let's talk about intersectionality. Let's overlay that with the with with the racial aspect. Individuals who identify as Latinx, Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander are most likely to experience barriers to accessing food. Again, access in in Bloomington. So mm-hmm. here in Bloomington, right? As mm-hmm. well as individuals who do not identify as male or female, and individuals situated and mostly the Southern zip codes of Bloomington. Mm. So now, so we already see we have an overall arching lack of access to food. 45% of Bloomington residents, one in 10 are saying, I have lack access to at least one type of food. Then you take next step is people of color, BIPOC folks, black folks, indiv- in, indigenous folks, right? Cannot access local nutrient dense food. And then the third thing is the top five food access barriers experienced in Bloomington Mm -hmm. as Bloomington residents and order of prevalence are high food prices, right? The second is time to prepare and cook food, low wages, right? Housing costs and limited transportation. All right, now I, I look at that, this report was just so 
it almost took my breath away mm. because People's Market has been working specifically on the this issue of access since uh, 2019, you know, um, and we didn't have the numbers or the statistics like this, you know, telling us that this is what was happening. But as Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks, we were we knew it was happening in our own communities. We recognized that it was happening, that there was lack of access. And that it had to do with things like transportation. Yeah. Is your is your farmer's market or your or your food access point on a bus line? Is it walkable? Is it ADA compliant? Is it, you know, all these things um, that make your location physically accessible? Is it physically access accessible? Is it in a gentrified space? What neighborhood is it in? Yeah. Is, is, it, is it serving a neighborhood that's already oversaturated with access to local nutrient-dense food? If so, I would argue you're, it's not doing a lot to help food justice and especially racial justice in that, in that intersectionality. So it, 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 it's, it's been fascinating to me to read this and, and to be doing the work that we've been doing over the last two years and it really just speaks to all of these needs in this, you know, specific report for Bloomington. I mean, the other thing I was, the first one was high food prices, right? You know, yeah, we already, we intuitively already knew that we as yeah. individuals looked around Bloomington and we love that we have all of the, we, we do and in comparison to other communities, we do have, you know, a selection, a handful of spaces where we can access local nutrient dense food. It's a question of whether you can afford it or not. Right. Um, and so that's I mean, there were three is. factors right there. I mean, three of three, this, it sounds like three different factors, but it was low right. wages, high housing costs and the cost of food. Like all of that means, yes. you know, that's a financial barrier. It's a financial barrier, which is one reason why we, we created this with people's market. We created this sponsored box program. Right. And even on primal, the primally inspired side. So we, we, well, like I said, we offer the sponsored meat, produce, eggs and bread. And so the bread option that you can request and sponsor is primarily inspired seduction loaf. So we made sure that we put the most nutrient dense option available and then primarily inspired reduces our price, you know, our, our by $2. So we make it even more affordable, not just for, for customers, but we also want to, um, we also want to incentivize people to purchase their own seduction loaf and get a $2 discount. And then you Maybe you have a little extra, you can go ahead and sponsor a loaf too. Mm -hmm. um, and so that afford hitting that affordability issue, um, operating on the ground at the, you know, on the ground market that we do, operating with a sliding scale. We have a shared people's market table where you can, uh, you know, if all you you could take food. If you and if you have nothing to give, then you take the food and you get the food. If you are in a better place financially, you pay a little bit more. Um, to help subsidize subsidize those that can't. So at, at every access point, whether it's the online store or whether it's on the ground, we want to try to make and break down that barrier of affordable nutrient dense food. Um, and again, the EBT, the doubling the EBT bucks is a huge one as well, uh, because we know federally they just increased that amount for families, yeah. which that that helps a lot and they, we also don't put a cap on doubling right. it. so if you're a family of six you need more than maybe um one loaf of bread for the week or you need i mean i have a 15 year old and an eight year old and they eat a lot you know <laughs> yeah. they eat a lot maybe you need two produce bags maybe you need two dozen eggs and not one dozen eggs our whole point is in order to try to fill that gap of racial injustice within the local food system, we know we have to get that food to those that are experiencing food scarcity. And mm -hmm. historically that has been marginalized folks. Can I just say this too, that I, I really love the idea of the way that you double the SNAP dollars, that those are federal yes. dollars that yes. when people come to the people's market or another market like yes. it, because like I said, we've got some yes. international folks out there listening. And before yes. we hang, before we finish today, I want to ask you to give them some advice for how, because if you're in Bloomington, Indiana, you know, we're making a bunch of recommendations here. If you're somewhere yeah. else, I'm going to get Brandy to give you some advice for how to find the most, um, you know, just market, like how to make sure that you're 
what, yes. what questions you have to ask to find this in your own community or, star, or start it. But let me just yeah, say this absolutely. really quick about the SNAP program. You know, those are federal dollars. Um, and historically speaking, like you were talking about, you know, very briefly, this is just a brief skim of, of the story there, but basically um, black and brown farmers, indigenous farmers, I mean, not only did they have their land taken, but when it came time to redistribute land or to, right, to, to invite westward expansion, yeah. all of those programs, and even when we go into the Great Depression, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of those programs um, discriminated against yeah. Yeah. black and yeah. brown farmers. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't yeah. get loans. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in this way, I, what I love is the little bit of like reparations work that can happen if we spend our SNAP dollars, that's federal money being refunneled back into um, farmers, um, you know, to black and brown landowners, as opposed to you can buy damn Frito-Lays with those SNAP dollars too. And think about where right. that money's going and who you know, does the CEO of Frito-Lay, there's like six major corporations that own all the packaged foods on the planet. And when you think mm -hmm. about the billions and trillions of dollars that we as consumers funnel into the hands of those people who don't think twice about um, harming the land, right? harming you know, the people who, who live on the land, harming exactly. those of us who consume their products, like profit is their bottom line, their top concern, yep. what drives them. And if we can yep. shift our spending away from yes. those people, we're paying the wrong people, right? Yep. And shift Absolutely. our dollars into the hands of those who, who carefully steward the land, um, yep. who are fighting to make sure that it is nutrient dense food. I think we need to redefine yes. food. Right. But yeah, I just wanted absolutely. to put that out there. I, I love that, you know, I, put the money where it goes, where it needs to go. Right. Absolutely. And I would say that's where we, we hold, um, we unabashedly, uh, when it comes to people's market, pursue any form of reparations, um, within the local food system, within our communities. And you're exactly right. I mean, so if you are a Bloomington resident and you can shop with people's market and you have, or you have, you have a selection of air of places where you can shop for local nutrient dense food, right? Um, you're, you're already making a bit of a conscientious decision because of what you said, Darcy, you're taking funds away from those larger corporations who are killing our planet and killing us. Um, is the bottom line, right? And calling it food. Um, and so because I'm sorry, time out, but they own the food companies. They also, I mean, they're, they're, they're selling food. They're also selling the chemicals that they yep. spray on the soil Absolutely. that grows Absolutely. this, this Absolutely. toxic food. So they're, they're profiting all around. Right. That's why I don't hesitate to say, that's why I don't hesitate to say that they are, you know, they are killing our planet and they are yep. killing us. I mean, that's the bottom line. So when you yeah. take funds away from them and you choose to shop locally with, you know, local farmers and local food entities, you're already making a step in the right direction. Uh, what I would say is that's kind of when we like try to superimpose this lens of intersectionality and racial justice onto it because it's so imperative. Because again, it's, it's black, brown, indigenous and marginalized folks who are predominantly suffering from the effects of these, the, the, this, these toxic companies who are killing us and putting, putting toxic things in our bodies, right? Will you um, say why, Brandy? Will you take a minute to explain that? There are a lot of you know, white women out there who, like me, just didn't yeah. have the whole deep story. Will you say, because we hear, oh, you know, black and brown bodies suffer from all this stuff, but can you explain? that just in a little more detail to help people really like get this what's happening yeah I because mean, if so we're white i'm sorry I, if you know if we have white privilege what part of that privilege is um being able to be oblivious about it so if you'll just take yeah absolutely yeah yeah, I mean, yeah. so in relation to it affecting black and brown so it, i mean we can go back a lot so if, if historically it, it all goes back to access, quite honestly. So depending on the neighborhoods that you live in and the food that you have access to, there are many neighborhoods who, have, who are composed mostly of black, brown, indigenous, marginalized folks who only have like a gas station and the food that is available in that gas station to purchase. And there is no 
access point to, you know, it's a, it's called like a food desert or, yeah. a, and this, and this has predominantly happened historically in black and brown communities. And so the ability to, and, and that has been a systemic and intentional institutionalized yes. move. Um, because like I said, the fact is that we do live in a violent colonial settler um, system that was built on white supremacist ideology. And that ideology's main point was to gatekeep, create yes. barriers, um, oppress, um, you know, and make it more difficult for brown and black marginalized folks to thrive. And so, so that, so that so, white people so could feel more comfortable. So that white people could feel more comfortable. This, I mean, the country was built on the backs of brown, black, and indigenous folks, whether you want to talk about the genocide of um, Native Americans and indigenous folks, or if you want to talk about slavery, or if you want to talk about, you know, Mexican, Latinx individuals, with, you know, co coming to even Indiana. I mean, historically, if you look at what is the history of farming and um, the Mexican immigrant labor, labor workers, when you look back, you know, into like the 1940s and yeah. World War II, like we were importing, there was a need, a lot of these big corporations that we're talking about now, like, you know, that were canning ketchup or those sorts of things were like bringing in mm -hmm. immigrant workers and it was, and it was like celebrated in the community, right? Because there was a need for workers and they were mistreated and mm -hmm. abused. And sometimes like, well, when they, when they weren't doing work in the factory, like would be hired out to the local farmers as farm hands, but wouldn't be paid for that labor and the corporations would be paid for that labor. Mm -hmm. um, and so like every single category that you look at, um, you see the systemic white supremacist ideology, you see the way it was consciously intentionally used to marginalize folks, to ostracize folks, to gatekeep and create barriers to access mm -hmm. to be able to thrive as human beings. Um, and so it isn't as simple as, it's never been as simple as, at least for black, brown and indigenous folks, it's never been as simple as choosing, you know, to buy a bunch of carrots over buying Gatorade yeah. and a candy bar. It is about access. Right. It is about um, inequity in that access from transportation to affordability, to location, yeah. to gentrification, to, I mean, there's just all these layers. And when you, even when I start talking about all these layers, I can feel that in my body. Right. Like, Let's talk about body, that. Yeah. Yeah. It, you can feel as a black, brown, or indigenous individual, you can feel the heaviness of those layers. And when you're just, I mean, we all know the challenges, we all have challenges, regardless of what our racial identity is and how we present into this world. Um, but when you are all start, your starting point is carrying these generational inequities and traumas into the world and in your body, it makes the atrociousness of the inequity of the access to be able to remedy that for black and brown folks that much more devastating right like that's the part that drives me that's what, like i can feel it like i we ha like I, that's why i said we it, it you that's why centering that's so when you go to shop this circles back around and around where you choose to spend your dollars right like so okay we're taking away from the larger corporations we're going to shop local we have these, we have a, we have a pretty broad for, for a small community. Bloomington has a pretty broad um, selection of places where they can access fresh, local, nutrient-dense food, right? Mm -hmm. Great. We have, we're ready to make that decision. As a brown woman and carrying all these things that I'm talking about carrying, I'm certainly going to be looking at that choice through that particular lens, through that racial equity lens, right? Right. So if I can choose it to buy from an organization that literally centers intersectional anti-racism within my local food system, and I know that when I go hand and buy that bunch of carrots or beets or greens or whatever it might be, I'm literally buying and helping to support and helping to break down barriers to access to land and growing for black and brown and indigenous farmers, because that's what people's market does is we prioritize black, brown and indigenous farmers and growers, because that's a form of reparations. That's a way that we can attempt to 
um, level the playing field. We right. can help to invest back in their farms by give, paying them. We, we literally, we never ask our farmers to take a cut in what they provide to people's market. They get paid 100% of funds. So that means whether you are buying food for yourself or even if you're getting on there to sponsor food for someone else, so not only you are literally in that simultaneously breaking down access and barriers for both the grower mm -hmm. and the consumer, because we're going to turn around and we're going to pay our, our, our BIPOC farmers 100% for that food that you just purchased. And we are going to deliver that food for free to the consumer who requested it and said, I'm experiencing food scarcity. And again, those are those individuals historically have been black, brown and marginalized folks. Of course. So that's so when I'm making this decision on where am I going to spend my dollars and racial equity within the food system is important to you or racial equity in general and rep and, and contributing to a form of reparations is important to me. I'm going, I'm going to choose people's market. And and if we're talking quite like honestly and rawly, people's market really is the only organization that has anti-racist intersectionality at its core that drives its mission values and goals and overlays every decision, every, um, yeah, every mark we make in this community is going to be through that particular lens. Um, and I'm honored that to be a part of that driving force because I think it's been a huge it's been a huge missing component in this particular community. You know, sure. I didn't know that. I, I, was, I had even lulled myself into, into you know, a, a, a little bit of a sense of, um, maybe it more of a, more of just being asleep, I guess. Sure. And, and not necessarily being so focused on just having local nutrient dense food in your community was the most important thing. And actually we have all of these intersectionalities that make a huge difference. So can um, I ask you that there? Because yeah, so Bloomington actually has this option. And for the folks out there that are watching in other places, mm -hmm. what do you recommend? So if they're all fired up now, we're like, well, heck yeah, I hadn't yes. thought about this. Not only do I need to find a local farmer to buy from, but I yes. want to make sure that it's, you know, that it's helping make reparations, that it's contributing yes. to social and racial and food justice. What kind of questions would you advise people to either ask their farmers or to ask around? Like, how can we make sure this this philosophy, um, you know, can so in other places? I'm not yes. articulating my question very well, am I? No, I think absolutely. I no, I totally understand. We definitely. I mean. Because you've started that here. You started it not that right, long ago right. because you woke up and said, this is what we have to do. So right. what about other right. places? I mean, I do recommend people buy from farms instead of grocery stores when possible. But I mean, how do we make sure that, I mean, how do we, if we have a choice, how do we choose a farmer? Like, how do we know? Yep. This is a really good question. Yeah. And I think you, this is where, so the other, the other important aspect of this is the relational aspect, right? Um, one of the things I would point out is that, you know, people's market is a cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, it's relational. We build relationships. And mm -hmm. so that is a core part of how to interact with your local farmers and your local food system. So you, act, you really have to get involved. I know that people don't have a lot of time. But knowing your farmer, knowing what they produce, how they produce it, asking them the questions of, um, you know, how do you feel about uh, access or, or, or even are you doing anything to help to break down the barriers to access mm -hmm. to the food that you're growing for historically marginalized folks? Gotcha. Do, or even ask it. And if a farmer says, I don't know, I haven't really yeah. done, I don't know, yeah. and say, or even have you thought about the importance of, you know, breaking down some of the barriers. How many, if you're visiting a farmer's market in your community, how many of the farmers and vendors are Black or BIPOC or Indigenous folks? Mm -hmm. that's, that's another question. I mean, if you walk around a lot of our farmer's markets, mm -hmm. they are, a lot of our farmer's markets are very much white spaces. Yeah. And when you look around, you also won't see many Black, Brown, BIPOC or Indigenous consumers either right. in those and so that's one indication. If that's always around, a flag, isn't it? Yeah. If you're in an, that's I, a, I, that's a flag. That's a flag. And then that's also mm -hmm. a, um, 
you know, a, a big marker or a, maybe a motivational factor in how do you get involved and start asking those questions of the organ of the of those that are organizing around those particular farmers markets. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it is a very much and in in recent in the recent years we also know there has been a rise in um, you know white supremacist organizations and individuals who are using local food movements to recruit people and. So there really is a need to be cognizant, um, understand the his- history of it, understand what reparations are, you know, understand how um, all this inequity has built up over generations and why reparations are important because reparations are really about, really about saving people's lives. I mean, that, that's, 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 I mean, especially when you're talking about food access and nutrition and health. And yeah. we're talking about the difference in people living and people dying, you know, and, and that's, I don't know what gets more fundamental than that. I don't either. I feel like we should just pause there for a minute and like, just let the weight of that kind of sink in. Like right. a lot of us tend to think, well, this is my white privilege speaking, right? Think about reparations as sort of, you know, paying back or, you know, redistributing right. things. And what you're talking about is like, Reparations is about making things right now so that black and brown bodies don't continue to die at the same rates. Yes. 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 And let's, um, we, we, we could go on for hours, but I, I do, and I don't want to cut this short at all, but I I do want to, before we wrap up, I want to connect this thread to what you said in the beginning. And I can't remember if we were recording yet or not, but you and I talked about how, um, well, because this is what I teach as well. Like we keep saying nutrient dense, like your body (laughs) needs nutrients. They come from the soil. It has to be mineral rich soil that the food was grown in it. And so much of what we're seeing in terms of um, death and disease rates has to do with the fact that we, and disproportionately black and brown bodies do not have the nutrients to make and repair and heal yes. and function yes. like that is necessary. Yes. And, um, I know you're kind of living this right now too. this idea that like, um, yeah. Would you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. Ask me, be a little, what were you asking me? Again? So I'm just asking to make the connection back to all of the stuff that we're talking about in terms of food justice, racial justice, um, and making reparations so that people don't die. <laughs> um, yeah. That we that this is all about really taking care of this physical body and the connection between food and farming and land and physical health. Like this is not this is not theoretical. You know, this is not abstract. This is very a very concrete and real concept, right? What you put in your yes. body is what matters. Yeah. And you live this. I know you live this way. So I yes, I do. Yes. So that's. I mean, one of the things that um, I guess it's a form of resistance, even for me mm, to. Wow. I mean, honestly, I feel like that it re- it truly is a form wow. of resistance to fight for and give my body, my family, my children's bodies access to fresh local nutrient dense food because I know that it's the basis um it's the basis of health for anyone who even is in balance and is not necessarily carrying the generational trauma of racial Mm -hmm. injustice and my resistance is in doing that hopefully allows for yeah, I mean, allows for my own health and well-being is what I'm fighting for, quite honestly. Um, and if I can help to repair some of that myself by what I'm ingesting, what I'm putting in my body, what I am exposing myself to, I'm resisting those institutional, those historically institutional and systematic um, systems or or or, or um, methods that have been used to historically marginalize, maim, and kill harm. black and brown bodies and harm. Yes, harm. to create harm. It, it's actually, I mean, it's harm reduction, quite honestly. Yeah, that's, it is. That's a better term for it. I mean, literally, it's a radical move of resistance and or by by 
by pushing and grasping for everything we can to provide our bodies with health and nutrition is literally an act of harm reduction. Wow. I love, I love that. I love that you yeah. just said that. I just, I feel like that needs to sink, you know, sink in. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and that's, that's the other thing. Let's not forget that's one area yeah. where we can try to, yeah. as a, as, as black, brown and indigenous folks that we can try to reduce some of the harm that, that is being perpetuated in this current system that we live in, because we know there's all these other areas beyond a local food system that is either creating or reducing harm perpetually for Black, Brown, Indigenous, and marginalized folks. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, and, and it's impactful. I mean, I, it's never been more impactful than, you know, currently for us, we have, a, we have our son is, has had a health crisis an unexpected health crisis, which has been um, devastating for, for our entire family. It's been especially difficult for this mama to process because, um, you know, I, I have constantly prioritized and centered um, health and nutrition for my children. And, you know, we've always, always had access or I've always at least um, prioritized access so that, um, they were not being deprived of, of those types of things. And even in the midst of that and doing the best we can um, to provide those things and growing our own food and you know cooking from scratch and baking from scratch and all of those things, um, it's, been, it's been difficult to process and digest the fact that we are still mm -hmm. um, exposed to things out of our control you know, and that we still can have a health crisis um, but the first thing that we do in that, in the midst of that is start asking our ourselves, you know, how do we get to the root cause of this? Yes. Certainly I mentioned to you using Western medicine, which, you know, uh, I, it's, it's kind of one of those both and situations, you know, Western medicine was absolutely necessary in, um, saving Ben's life and, um, getting, you know, trying to get his body calmed down from, from being in this, you know, serious state of inflammation and, right. and kind of starting to shut down. And then, um, but now we also know and understand that it's actually the holistic approach and the nutrition and all of these other things that need to be added on to try to get him to the root. well too. Yeah, yeah. To get yeah. to the root of what caused this, this, you know, acute onset of, of a health crisis. Um, and it's not easy. It's not easy. It, no. it, it, these sorts of things that we're experiencing I'm so, I even am so look at the privilege that I have and where I'm at in, a, in the community that I live in, where I actually live, the people that are around me and the access that we have certainly improves um, the odds of Ben getting well. But it also makes me think, especially after we had a long stay at Riley Children's Hospital, it's, it's such a counterculture space to be in, not counterculture, but almost um, culture shock. Yes. Because you're not used to being in a space where all the children are very ill. And of course, my mind immediately sitting there as a mama is, is thinking of first the inequity of our healthcare system and who that is predominantly affecting. And the fact that a lot of these kids are not going to have access to some of these other resources and tools. Um, and that is is shameful to me, you know, shameful. And it and becomes an even further driving force in the work that I do out in the community yes. and through people's market. And it's like, okay, it's added to the list of reasons why we need to do this work. Um, it creates a real sense of urgency and drives me every day when I wake in the morning. It's not just about my kid and getting him well or providing for our family and us having access to be able to grow and eat well. It's, it's about other families and specifically those who have um, historically experienced the system we live in as violent and inequitable, you know? So those are the folks that I'm constantly going to be turning to um, in, in, a, in, in an effort to create some sort of reparation. Well, I am uh, sending you a, a mama's hug to your mama heart. I, I know what it's like to parent through um, a, a child through a medical emergency and it is, um, it's tough to do. 
and not not even to mention with what you just said you know all the additional layers of stress and trauma and violence um that you have you know that you're trying to stand up under the weight of all of that and then you add a child's medical emergency so and i just want to say this word too for you and but for all my listeners you know this uh, a lot of what brandy is talking about here um what we experience then in the body then is based i mean it's as simple as stress and mm -hmm. you know when we're dealing with all of these um multiple forces um mm -hmm. that are against us that threaten our very lives and well-being and i say our it's i mean as humans we all have these threats um i am a white woman so i'm absolutely in a place you know of far less threat um yeah than my black and brown uh sisters and friends so what I just want to say about that is that overall, the cumulative effect of generational stress, of environmental stress, um, mm -hmm. is debilitating for our immune yes. systems, for our brain function, um, for our healing and metabolic processes. You know, so um, it is not. You know, it's it's not like it's just this abstract thing. It's a very real thing. It's um, a very scientific, yeah. biological yes. thing, and you yes. see how why when I say you're talking when you're talking about you're really you're really hitting um, the center of that in the sense that racial justice within the food within food justice is really the starting point, right? Because if you it, with your immune system with all these things, all these things, your neurological system, it affects how kids learn. Yes. It affects how we how productive we are in our job. Yes. It affects how we are able to parent. It affects, do you know what I mean? So it, it mm -hmm. has just such a rippling effects, which is why I feel like it's but it's such important um equity work to be doing. It feels like we're really it's like that soil like digging down to the root of how to start creating an equitable system. Mm. And if we start by reducing these stressors, reducing these traumas, reducing these cortisol levels, reducing, yes. right? right. And, and, and replacing it with affordable nutrient-dense food, easy access to that nutrient-dense food in a dignified yes. um, manner, that really seems like that's just real gut legacy type work for me, yes. you know? Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be a part of the work and I'm really proud of um, all the work that uh, all, we, all, all of us have done with People's Market. There's a lot of individuals involved mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's driven and, and ran and organized by black, brown and indigenous folks. And so yeah, we're we're all thinking at this depth of rooting out um, systemic systemic raci racism and um, yeah, systemic inequality and access to local food. It's important. It's imperative. It's it's like it, it's it's life or death. It's life or death. Well. Just gonna take a pause there and let that sink in. I want to. We we really are out of time. I I want to. I want to thank you so much for your time today, for your generosity in sharing your expertise with us. I want to sh thank you for the work you do in our community. Um, and I want to ask you how, how can we invite folks to help? Um, so in, if you're in Bloomington, you can absolutely um, support the people's market in a couple different ways, right, Brandy? You can purchase food there. You can purchase um, food to donate. Yeah. You can make a you can make a monetary donation. So we'll put monetary. some links below, I think. And that if folks if folks are elsewhere, how how else can how can we help? What can we do? Yeah. So um, all the things that you mentioned in relation to people's market, you can definitely sponsor boxes. Um, you know, unemployment has ended. Um, some of the extra SNAP federal benefits have ended. And so in, in correspondence with that, we have seen a large increase in requested food, quite okay. honestly. And so sponsoring food each and every week, you can do if you live here, you can do if you live across the country, you can do if you live out of the country. Um, and we will make sure that that gets to people in this community that are experiencing food scarcity. You can definitely donate um, just purchasing to People's Market for your own products, produce, meat, bread, eggs. We have, you know, a, a pantry products and baked goods and all kinds of things out on the online store, soaps. And um, there's just a smorgasbord of, of items out there that you can buy for yourself. So that's one way to support 
um, People's Market and to support BIPOC and Black Indigenous marginalized folks um, and their businesses and their farms because that's who we're prioritizing. Um, and then even volunteering. If you are local, we are an all volunteer organization. And so we always need volunteers to help with our CSA boxes on the ground, um, all those sorts of things. So if you, you know, email, uh, reach out to people's market, btown.org or follow people's market um, on social media, then you can find ways to sign up in that uh, for that. And then, um, yeah, as far as individually as, um, you know, a BIPOC female business owner, certainly purchasing from Primally Inspired Eats is great. We have an online store, primallyinspiredeats.com. Um, you can check out all of our products that we have there that you can um, buy and pick up locally. We have some products that we ship, so you can do that as well. We also um, have a section around um, our urban farming, and so you can kind of take a look at how we're growing our own products and um, and then we also now have a small uh, donation page up as well, just uh, regarding uh, helping with to support um, Ben Heal, which is my son, Benjamin. So this has been a, we're, we're like three months into this journey right now and, and still deeply steeped into trying to get him what he needs and, and trying to find equity and access to what he yes. needs within our, within our healthcare system, quite honestly. And that requires a lot of um, love which is already there for him, but also requires a lot of time and money. Um, <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying, financial, financial yeah. resources yeah. And, and an intense amount of energy, sure. um, which doesn't allow us to operate our business quite as you know smoothly as we typically would. So there's an area out there. Um, we have a GoFundMe page, Help Ben Heal, or you can go to our website, people are go to our website, primalinspiredeats.com, and there's a Help Ben Heal section, and you can kind of check out his story and um, donate there as well. But yeah, uh, so I'll provide those overall, links. Mm -hmm. Yeah, informing yourself as well, you know, right. informing yourself about your, about your local food system, you know, this, this Bloomington food access report was easy to get our hands on. It was a little easier because um, one of our planning committee members, Dr. Dr. Angela Babb was a part of that research. Um, but knowing the specifics, I mean, because when you look at those statistics in your own community, you kind of, it's, it's pretty easy to see where the resources are needed and, and how you can help, how you can help contribute to reparations just by helping put your resources in those areas. Absolutely. And so if we didn't know already, um, yeah, there's definitely something we can do and it just requires becoming um, more informed and more conscious of our choices Absolutely. around purchasing food, who we buy from, what we buy. Yes. Absolutely. Well, this has been so informative and enlightening. I am just, I want to thank you again. I want to um, let people know we're going to put some links below if you want to learn more about the People's Market in Bloomington and Brandy's work with her business. Um, I'm going to put the link below as well for my Vibrant Woman course. It The registration is open. It's going to start in January. I think one of the most important things I want to say about that in wrapping up is that there is so much more to learn. And so as a way to provide access to that knowledge and information, after the Vibrant Woman course finishes, I'm going to open up a membership for um, graduates only. And inside that membership, I will do monthly Q&As with me. I'll do a monthly um, deep dive into a topic that um, folks just kind of need more support around. And every month we're going to invite in a guest expert. And so Brandy's agreed to come in at least once uh, during that first membership year and share more information and answer questions um, from the people in that group. So if you really like that idea, then Vibrant Woman Course and Community is going to be for you because we are going to see her again in there. So on that thank note, that. I think I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Darcy. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, Brandy.